During the interview process, many employers ask candidates to complete an assessment test before advancing to the next stage. These tests are designed to measure skills that are essential for candidate success on the job. An example of such an assessment is a mechanical aptitude test. Employers use mechanical aptitude tests to evaluate practical understanding of mechanical concepts, spatial reasoning, basic physics, and the ability to work with tools, systems, or machinery in the real-world settings. Let me show you examples from these tests that will help you prepare, pass, and get hired. Coming up on online training for everyone. Two identical blocks start from a height of one yard at the same time. Block 1 drops vertically. Block B slides down a frictionless 30-degree ramp, with no air resistance, which hits the ground first. Let's break it down. Both blocks start at the same height and are only affected by gravity. Since they fall the same vertical distance and gravity is constant, they take the same amount of time to reach the bottom. What's important here is that the ramp alters the path of one block, but because it's frictionless and there is no air resistance, it doesn't affect the time for the vertical descent. And the correct answer here is choice C. Here's the cool question for you. Which of the following movement sequences will return a shape to its original orientation? Did you get to the right answer? Reflecting a shape twice over the same line cancels the transformation. In fact, it's the only option that's put the shape right back where it began, perfectly aligned. The correct answer here is choose B, reflect twice over the same line. A sheet of paper is folded in half three times. Then one hole is punched through all the layers. How many holes will appear when it's fully unfolded? Each fold doubles the layer. Picture the folds. 1 becomes 2 after the first fold. 2 becomes 4. Can you guess what 4 becomes? Now imagine hole punching through every layer. One punch equals 8 visible holes when unfolded. And the correct answer is choose D, 8. Four identical vessels, each containing a different amount of liquid, are all heated to the same temperature. In which vessel will the liquid cool the fastest? To answer this question, apply the principle of heat loss per unit volume. Liquids with less volume cool faster because they have less thermal mass and greater surface-to-area volume ratio. Since vessel D has the least amount of liquid, it will lose heat the fastest, making it cool down the quickest. So the correct answer here is choice D. You throw four identical balls with the same speed but at the different angles. Which ball will travel the farthest horizontally? Let's break it down. 30 degrees stays low. It's fast but shallow. 60 degree goes high but falls back quickly. 90 degree just goes up and drops. So the correct answer here is choose B, 45 degrees. It balances height and distance, giving the longest flight across the field. Which hill will give the cyclist the highest speed at the bottom, assuming no friction and no air resistance? A cyclist's final speed depends on the vertical height descended, not the steepness of the hill. A long, gentle hill allows the cyclist to accelerate gradually and continuously without interruption. This smooth descent leads to the highest speed at the bottom when friction and air resistance are ignored. The correct answer here is choice B. Why does a longer, shallower ramp makes it easier to lift a heavy object to the same height? Here's the riddle of physics in everyday life. Push a box up a steel ramp and it feels like a workout. But stretch that ramp out, make it longer and shallower, and suddenly it's easier. Why? Because while the height is the same, you're spreading the work over a long distance. This reduces the force you need to apply it at any moment. The total work doesn't change, but the ramp gives you mechanical leverage. The correct answer here is choice C. There are four candles of the same size and each has an automatic fire extinguisher that moves toward the flame at the same constant speed. Which candle will be extinguished first? Mm -hmm. 
Look at the distance between each extinguisher and its flame. Which one has the shortest path? Do you see it? The correct answer here is choice D. What happens to the water level when a floating ice cube melts in a glass of water? Have you ever wondered why your glass doesn't overflow when ice melts? Let's break it down. When ice floats, it pushes water out of the way, just enough to match the weight, but not the volume. That's the key. Ice takes up exactly the space it had originally displaced. So the final answer is choice A. A light ray traveling through air strikes a smooth water surface at a 45 degree angle to the surface. What happens to the ray as it enters the water? When a light ray moves from a less dense medium, which is air, to a denser medium, which is water, its speed decreases, causing it to bend toward the normal, an imaginary line perpendicular to the surface of the point of contact. And the correct answer here is choice B. You've got eight identical looking balls, but one is slightly heavier. And you only have two chances with the balance scale to find the heavier ball. What do you do? Let's start by weighting three balls versus three balls. If they're equal, the heavy one will be in the remaining two. If one side is heavier, great. Now just weigh two balls from that group. The result will lead you straight to the odd one out. And the correct answer here is choice C. Which container, always the same total volume, will overflow the fastest if water is poured into each one at the same rate? Take a close look at all the containers. In three of them, water will fill gradually. But in one container, the hole causes it to leak halfway through the fill, making it the first one to overflow in function, not in the form. So the correct answer here is choice C, a container with the hole halfway up the side. Take a close look at these three connected gears. If the bottom left gear, the largest one, rotates clockwise, what is the direction of the top gear, the smallest one? Each gear flips the motion of the one before it. So, clockwise, counterclockwise, and clockwise again. The correct answer is choice A, clockwise. Are you ready for a brain hack? Remember, practicing often can make you smarter and sharper. Let's dive in into this question to supercharge your mechanical aptitude skills. Two kids are playing on the seesaw. One child weights twice as much as the other. The heavier child sits closer to the center. If the heavier child sits 70 inches from the center, how far should the lighter child sit to make the seesaw balanced? Your choices for the answers are choice A, 35 inches, choice B, 70 inches, choice C, 140 inches, and choice D, as close as possible. Remember, we're enhancing your skills here to make you smarter, so you need to solve this question yourself. And just like on the real test, I'll set a timer for you to solve this. Make sure to lock in your answer before timer's up. Let's begin. Time's up. Have you locked in your answer? Now let's go through the solution together, and you will be amazed how simple it is to solve it. When two children sit on the seesaw, weight is applied on the both sides. A seesaw balances when the weight and the distance on both sides create equal force, called torque. Since the heavier child weights twice as much, the lighter child must sit twice as far to balance the seesaw, keeping the torque equal on both sides. Since the heavier child sits 70 inches from the center, it means that the lighter child should sit 140 inches away to balance the seesaw. And the correct answer here is choice C, 140 inches. I think this question is not just about engineering, but also about your critical thinking and analytical skills. If you use the same bow to shoot arrows at angles of 45 degrees, 0 degrees, and 60 degrees, which angle will make the arrow travel the farthest? You have four possible choices. Choice A, 45 degrees. Choice B, 0 degrees. Choice C, 60 degrees. And last but not least, choice D, neither one. Take a close look to see if you can come up with the answer. 
On my end, I am moving forward to share with you my version of the analysis and answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. Let's start by looking at the scenario where we shoot the arrow at zero degrees, which ultimately means horizontal shot. When you shoot it at zero degrees, it means you're firing it horizontally parallel to the ground. In this case, the arrow initial velocity is responsible for its horizontal distance because there is no vertical component in its motion. What's interesting here is that the arrow will cover some horizontal distance, but it won't travel very far because gravity starts acting on it immediately, pulling it downward. Now let's compare it to shooting an arrow at a 60 degree angle. This means we are launching it at a steeper angle upward compared with even 45 degree angle. What's interesting in this case is that while it still have a horizontal component, more of its initial velocity is directed upward. As a result, the arrow will reach a greater height but cover less horizontal distance before it hits the ground. Which brings us to the 45 degree angle solution. If you want to make sure your arrow reach farthest horizontal distance, you should shoot it at a 45 degree angle. 45 degree angle allows for the best balance between horizontal and vertical components of an arrow's motion, maximizing its range. So the correct answer here is choice B, 45 degrees. Did you get to the same answer? If not, please make sure to share your thoughts and rationale in comments so we can all learn. Here's an amazing question which tests your knowledge of objects, their properties, and the way they move from the top of the hill down to the ground. You're presented with three different objects, and you need to determine which object will reach ground first when pushed to slide from the top of the hill. You have four possible choices to select from. Choice A, wheel. Choice B, wooden box. Choice C, sticky substance. And last but not least, choice D, they all reach the ground at the same time. Take a close look, maybe pause this video to see if you can come up with the answer. On my end, I have my selection, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To determine the answer, let's look at each object individually. This will help us decide all the considerations related to their sliding from the top of the hill down to the ground. Let's start with the cube. Cube's shape may cause it to experience higher levels of friction against the slide, slowing its descent. But at the same time, sticky substance may move even slower. Because the behavior of sticky substance will largely depend on its viscosity and adhesive properties. If the substance is highly viscous and adheres strongly to the slide, it may experience significant resistance and it will take much longer for it to reach the ground. In some scenarios, depending upon viscosity, the sticky substance may never reach the ground at all. Based on this, I think most likely sticky substance will be the slowest in reaching down the bottom of the slide, followed by the cube, which would be second in the sliding down. So, as you might have guessed, I am putting my bets on the wheel. I think wheel's rolling motion will help reduce friction with the slide, allowing wheel to move more smoothly. This is why the wheel may reach the ground faster than all other objects. This is why I think the correct answer is choice A, wheel, because the wheel will roll and will have minimum friction to reach the ground. Did you come to the different conclusion? If yes, please make sure to post your answer, solution and rationale in comments so we can all learn. Let's look at the question where you need to determine the trajectory after parachutists jump from the plane. Obviously, based on the wind and other external conditions, there would be multiple choices. But fortunately, you need to select only one out of four possible choices. Choices A, B, and C. And if none of the choices A, B, and C is correct, you need to select choice D, which would represent neither one. Take a close look to see what is the parachutist's trajectory after jumping from the plane. I have full confidence in your skills and knowledge, so I'm moving forward to share with you my version of the answer. And obviously, if you have a better way to solve it, please make sure to post in comments. To better understand the answer, we need to determine what changes from when parachutist is inside the plane and when parachutist jumps from the plane. When parachutist is inside the plane, both the parachutist and the airplane are moving together in the same direction. When parachutist jumps from the plane, there are multiple forces that will determine the trajectory. 
Number one is inertia. According to Newton's first law of motion, the law of inertia, the parachutists will continue moving forward in the direction of the plane. Initially, the parachutist will have the velocity they had inside the plane, but they will slow down over time due to air resistance. Another force that will define the trajectory is the force of gravity. As soon as the parachutist leaves the plane, they will be subject to the force of gravity. Gravity pulls the parachutist downward toward the earth. And the last force that will drive the trajectory would be acceleration due to gravity. Acceleration due to gravity is the force that pulls objects toward the earth. When something is in the air, gravity causes it to fall toward the ground. The acceleration due to gravity is always the same for all objects near the Earth's surface, and it means that objects will fall faster and faster the longer they fall. So let's look closely at what's going to happen after parachutist jumps. After jumping, the parachutist initially maintains the horizontal velocity due to inertia. Once outside the airplane, they accelerate downward due to gravity until they reach terminal velocity. The deployment of the parachute increases air resistance, allowing for controlled descent, allowing parachutists to land safely. The closest answer that describes the solution is choice A. Is this what you got in your answer? If not, please make sure to post your solution and rationale in comments so we can all learn. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate you for helping us to become one of the largest YouTube channels to help people become smarter increase your IQ, and to pass any test. If the content of this video was helpful, please make sure to click the like button to help YouTube algorithm promote this video and help other people to find it faster. Giving us a like is also a way for you to tell us that you need more content like this, and when you tell us, we will deliver it for you in the future. For links to free and premium resources, please check the description and comments of this video. You can also go directly to our website, howtoanalyzedata.net, to download the materials related to this topic. I really appreciate your endorsement, support, and patronage of this channel. And thank you for considering to become a member and considering to subscribe. Please leave feedback, suggestions, or corrections in comments. And all the best on your journey. I'll see you in my next video.